Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Wednesdays at Noon with Pumpkin Futs. I'm your host, Shanique Ruiz, and I'm so happy to have Barbara connect with me this afternoon to talk about the collision of design and disability. I'm super excited about this conversation, and I'm going to wait to introduce Barbara so she can do it herself. She's the best <laughs> Her own introduction, so I'll allow her to do that. But before we go into that, I'm going to take this time to thank frontline workers and thank essential workers, the people that are on the front lines and making it possible for us to be at home and doing content like this and being safe and healthy. And I hope that everyone who is joining us today enjoys this conversation. And to that note, I want to say that this conversation will be ASL interpreted. So be sure to check back on our page in a few days to find that for anyone who needs that accommodation. Also, just a quick note, we do have a 20 second lag in the comments. So at the time when you send a comment, please don't think we're ignoring you. We want to hear from you. We want to see your comments. So please talk to us. Hi, Rebecca. I see Rebecca joined us. Thank you so much for joining us. So yeah, that's all of my announcements right now. And I want to get right into it. Barbara, could you let us know who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me to do this. I saw the program last week and it was pretty fabulous. So uh, <laughs> it's a lot to live up to. Um, and I was so just what's relevant to today is that I am an architect by profession, though I like to say I'm a uh, you know, distant from the actual practice of architecture. I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about design and how does the world work. And, um, but, to, but what's specific about my, my involvement here today is that in the 1970s, when I graduated from the University of California at Berkeley, um, I was invited by a professor of mine to work on a research project which resulted in a book called Design for Independent Living. Probably a lot of you know that the disability rights movement, one of its epicenters and one of the places where it started was Berkeley in the 1970s. So mm -hmm. I came in completely green um, and I had an incredible enlightening. Um, and what I learned through that experience really has informed my whole life's work since then. There are a few times when I've been directly involved in um, codes and design specifically related to disability. More often, it's just informed my way of thinking. But just to, for because we're in New York, um, in the 1980s, I worked with the New York City Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities on the pre-ADA Local Law 58, which um, was specific to New York City and, and tried to remove architectural barriers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and from 2002 to 2007, I worked with in Boston, where I am now, with the Institute for Human-Centered Design. And that kind of represents the, the breadth of what we're going to talk about today. Um, Shanique and I spent some time talking about this um, and uh, what we were going to say and how we were going to organize today's conversation. And we hope it will be a conversation. Um, and her story about looking for an apartment in Brooklyn was so important to, the, to our thinking that um, I asked if she would start the conversation with that story because I don't have lived experience. I have theoretical and design experience, but it's important to, to start with that story. So Shanique said she would. Yes, I will. And thank you so much, Barbara, for that awesome introduction. And that's why I want to <laughs> hand it over to you, because you are awesome at telling your own story. Um, but yes, I will uh, start with that. So I actually right now live independently um, with roommates in Brooklyn. And that process was extremely long. I was born and raised in the Bronx, and I moved out of my parents' house in 2018. And that process took longer than expected because as a person with a physical disability, for those out there who may not know, I have cerebral palsy and I use forearm crutches because of that. And because of that, I needed to look at things from a different perspective than a lot of able-bodied people might have to, such as how many stairs is it in the apartment or the house? 
Um, how far is it to the elevator if there is one? And if there's not, what floor am I going to be on? I would prefer as a person with a physical disability to be on the first floor. And that was extremely hard to be able to find an apartment in a room in, in those parameters and to know exactly where is this, how far is the supermarket from my apartment? How far is the laundromat from my apartment? Essential things like that, daily independent living, um, I guess, things that people have to do every day independently, I would need to know where those things are and how easy or how hard it is for me to get to those, to and from those places when I have things in my hand. Because not only do I, I walk with forearm crutches, but I will need to use things like a shopping cart or to hold bags on my own because I unfortunately do not have a... Um, home health aid or anything. That is something that has come up in my household at some point um, that I've considered, but I have not yet explored that option. So I do live fully independently and those are things that I had to think about and it was extremely hard. And uh, Barbara, you know this, I told you it was extremely hard for me to be able to find a place with no stairs. Right now my yeah, apartment yeah. has uh, three stairs to start and then I'm right on the first floor. So I got really lucky with that. But just some of the things that I, I saw during that process looking for my apartment, it was extremely frustrating. It was very, very kind of hard on me as a person with a physical disability, mm -hmm. feeling mm -hmm. like an afterthought. Like I, I don't always feel like people with any type of disability are thought about in the design process. And I, I hope that that's something that we can touch on and be honest about in this conversation. So I, I guess that's <laughs> where I'll leave it. And if you have any specific questions, Barbara, feel free to ask that. I I have a lot of questions <laughs> always, as you know. But what, it's, what it sparks for me mm. is that you know, eternal question about where does the ADA, which everybody refers to, right. fit into that story? And, you know, the ADA dates back to 1990 and it's sort of held up as this gold standard, but mm -hmm. we like to talk about it as as the, the ceiling. It's sort of the, you know, it, it's sort of set as far as we're gonna go rather than the floor, which opens up mm -hmm. um, a whole world of design. And I, I think that what one of the things that's important to understand about the ADA is it doesn't make the whole world available to people. Um, it It is a civil rights le legislation that uses design to reduce or remove barriers. And, and mm -hmm. I, I champion it because it was, you know, a huge step forward. There's so many things that we think are imperfect, but they at least move us move us forward. Um, I think that the question is, how come we haven't moved farther since then? And, I, and I'd like to argue that we have moved a little bit farther since then. But um, one, there's a couple of things about the ADA that I, that I like to kind of point out to people. One is that it's a civil rights legislation. It's not, it's not a design code, but it mm -hmm. uses a design code to carry parts of it out. The other thing is that it it has a definition of who it's intended to help. And it defines people with a disability as um, someone who has an impairment, that it's yeah. an impairment of the person. It's a, it's a characteristic of the person. And we'll see as our conversation goes on, we've moved away from that, but it, it kind of puts the onus on the, on the person. Um, and it's also very prescriptive and, and very limiting, which I've said before. It, it's sort of mm -hmm. like, tell me what I have to do and I'll just do it, meaning to the designer. You know, mm -hmm. what, what's the code? What do I have to do? And now I'm done. Rather than, you know, what's, what are we trying to achieve here? And, and I, I have a- that, I'm sorry to cut you off, yeah, Barbara. Yeah, yeah. I think that you, something that you said that really, really kind of stuck out to me was the fact that it's not on the person. It's, it helps to, I, I forgot exactly what it is, so I'm paraphrasing, but the way that you worded it, it it's basically to undisable a person, it, to right. work on the 
Right. You can right. sit in at any point <laughs> to yeah. say yeah. What, yeah. exactly <laughs> what it is. Well, had to say. yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 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 um, we're going to, we're going to get sort of more into this, but it's sort of, it's, it's putting the onus on the person. Um, yeah. And uh, Lisa, if you put up slide one, um, it's, it's this image of people have to adapt themselves to the environment. You know, in other words, this is uh, a person who's, you know, having to adapt to a, a box, for example. And it's, it's really saying that, um, we've designed a world and now we're asking everybody else to, to fit into it. So what we're trying to do is say design can be a process that changes that, that can also be a way that facilitates people's right. interactions with the environment. And then we, we wanted to show, um, if you're ready for it, Shanique, those three slides, um, or I should say Lisa, um, but the, the three slides that are kind of an example of, of, of what we're talking about, which is a building yeah. that um meets all the codes but it still doesn't work for people so this is and i don't mean to call them out in a negative way because it's really quite a beautiful building but this is the seattle public library and this is 2007 and this the image on the left is the entrance to the children's library so um you'll see it has this grand you know thing with the address the doorway with the address and it has a revolving door there and then next to it it has the door for people who use wheelchairs to come in and out. Mm -hmm. But it's the entrance to the children's library. So you see in the image on the right, you see these two women, I think the other one's a woman, with their with their um, strollers kind of looking like, how am I gonna get through the uh, revolving door, but am I allowed to come in the other door? So the next slide um, also shows what it looks like from the inside. Look, guess what? Everybody wants to use mm -hmm. the door that is intended for people who use wheelchairs, but in fact, it's a much better arrangement. And so over time, the next slide, um, they came back and they said, you know, this doesn't work. And they redesigned the outside of the building so that the main entrance and the only entrance so that everybody gets to use the same entrance That's is actually usable by everybody. Mm. So it's, it's, the point is that this original design met the code and to be fair, it was trying to do some, some environmental work with that revolving door. That's why people use those revolving doors, but it wasn't really, the point is it wasn't thinking about Who's actually needs to come in and out of this door, and how and mm -hmm. and, and and how are they going to move through that door? Um, and I think so that's, that's a great segue into universal design, too. Like, um, and we've used this example internally as a as a company in pumpkin fights. Like, if you design a a bathroom, a I guess handicap bathroom. I don't really like to use that word. No, I don't but, either, but it's okay. Yeah. So <laughs> if we design every bathroom that way, everyone can use it. Yeah. But yeah. if we design yeah. a normal, average sized uh, stall, not very wide, something that wheelchairs cannot fit in, it's limiting to only one type of person. And everyone exactly. I, I see. Yeah. Everyone I see always goes into the the bathroom that's meant for wheelchairs. And I just find that so funny. It's like, why don't we just make stalls like that everywhere for everyone? It's a great example because I think of it also, I especially think of it in airports because we because, and we'll come talk about this, because of curb cuts, we all have rolling suitcases now. So I don't know about you, but I travel on my own a lot and I'm trying to fit that rolling suitcase in a little tiny Absolutely, yeah. airports toilet stall. But then the reason there's only one or two that are accessible to people with wheel wheeled um whatever it is, either a wheelchair or a suitcase in an airport is because they're required to get a certain number of toilets into the room. Right. And they're only required to have a certain number that are accessible. Right. So even though it would make more sense, it, it doesn't happen because that's not what the code says and that's not what the standards are and that's not what it is. And yes, the question is, what is universal design, um, which which then will roll into what we call human-centered design. But just because it's kind of interesting to understand this evolution, 
you know, the ADA was 1990 and by 1997, um, Ron Mace, who was um, an architect and he used a chair and he was at the University of North Carolina, he developed um, something called the seven principles of universal design. And they are, they were things that grew out of the recognition of the limitations of, of the ADA. And it tried to identify, um, you know, like what, what is it we're trying to do here? And it was focused on architects and designers. And I'm gonna go to my crib sheet for a second. The seven principles are more detailed than what I'm gonna tell you. Um, and they have, you know, sub detail underneath them. But basically what, what they were trying to say is, everything you design should be equitable, flexible, intuitive, perceptible, safe, easy, and accommodating. Those were those are the seven principles and that's where universal design comes from. And, and it's, it's um, uh, it, there's, a, there's an example of sort of why it came about and, it's, and you were referring to before, if Lisa, if you put on the um, slide of the, of the curb cuts, everybody knows about curb cuts, right? Because, and they were a product of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we all know how poorly they work in some cities, <laughs> including New York. Um, and that, you know, I would argue is partly because mostly people think of them as something we have to do and we have to do them because the ADA tells us we have to do them. Um, but one of the things that has happened is that curb cuts have opened up the use of wheeled uh, objects, let's just say, um, mm -hmm. examples of which you see here, that have actually allowed people to do a tremendous number of things that they weren't able to do when they were hauling things up and down curbs. And if you build your curb cuts, these pictures are actually, I, it's a series I call One Day in Chicago. Right. And I have about 50 pictures around the city. Um, and this is just a series on, um, how curb cuts have allowed people to have rolling suitcases because before we had curb cuts, mm -hmm. the only people that used rolling suitcases were, were um, pilots and airline attendants. Um, but it allows grandma and grandpa to take the kids out because they can put them in that double stroller and kind of move on. And mom can take the double stroller, but also her kids can be on their, you know, rolling whatever scooters. And this elderly woman uh, who uses a, a rolling walker can also get out and around on her own. So the, the point is, and you made it, um, Yes, that is true. The vast majority of New York City curves still do not have curb cuts. It's shocking. I mean, it's actually right. shocking. It is. And I, yeah. and a great segue <laughs> into something that I've, I, I've been itching to say during this time that you are talking about this, Barbara. Uh, just a personal example. I was with my friend Katrina at the Brooklyn Public Library, and she has an electric wheelchair that she uses. And it was just amazing to me, something so monumental like grand army plaza something so monumental like brooklyn public library like she had to get her accessoride all the way on the other side of the street and we had to separate yep. from each other and then unite back because there was not a curb cut for her to go down yeah. on her ride yeah to. And if Katrina is watching somewhere out there, if she watches this, hi girl, I love you. <laughs> like, she's always such a great sport about it. Yeah. And I, it, I just think it's it's horrible for people yeah. who are in wheelchairs and people who need things like curb cuts, who, that should be automatic in some point. Yes. Like yes. at some point in yes. design. And they're just not, and it's so unfortunate. They, and, and they, the other thing that is my pet peeve is that, and this again gets to codes and, 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 and conflict about who's using the streets and how they're using them, and I don't wanna get into that, but they're narrow. And so they're actually usually crowded. And, and so the person who may benefit from them can't even get to them because they're right. it's New York City. There are 12 people in front of them. And right. so, and, and most people don't really have any consciousness about it. Whereas those ones that you saw in Chicago, they're, they're the whole width of the curb so that everybody has equal ability to actually use them. Not only, right. not only are they more common and well-made and they actually meet the, 
you know, the curb meets the street like it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. And if we're um, being honest about New York City, like our potholes are like no other. So a lot <laughs> of times when we do get curb cuts, they're ruined by like yeah. potholes and all of those kind of things. So it's you're, not the you're, in it. you're raising another issue and this is more ubiquitous in Boston. And that is, I live in a section of Boston when, when I'm here that has brick sidewalks. And that is one of these, this is another conflict that you'll see all the time is between the historic nature of buildings and cities and the desire to preserve that because we ruined a lot of it and the kind of inattention to what that impact is. Mm. I am a, I'm getting old, but I'm a very, I'm a, I'm a highly able-bodied person. And we don't walk on our brick sidewalks because they're terrifying. We walk in the middle they of the They are for me. So I, Lisa <laughs> is behind the scenes and she knows this. She's probably <laughs> laughing, but I've complained so much about where we are, we are located. Our office has cobblestone like streets. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. when I would go to get lunch, I would have yeah. to go a different way because there's like this one back street with cobblestones and cobblestones are so hard for me to walk yeah, on as yeah, a person yeah. with forearm crutches. And not only am I quick to fall because I do drag my feet, like not intentionally, but just automatically my body just does it. And when I drag my feet on cobblestone, I will go face first onto the ground. So yeah. I feel like that's not my fault. It's like, Cobblestone should not exist, but it, it goes back to your statement yeah. about historical yeah. pieces of design that are. Yeah. See, Rebecca just said Dumbo is beautiful, <laughs> but ah, yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, as as someone who has worked on all the, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm glad you took that question down, Lisa, because I don't know the answer to that. So that's really intriguing and we should come back to it, the social distancing and how it will affect design. But I wanted to comment that, you know, I, I, I am sympathetic because of my profession to the, to the millions of um, uh, parameters that that designers are trying to satisfy. Some are codes, some are requirements, some are desires, some are wishes. And what we're you know what we're trying to do is move to this idea of human centered design. That was my next um, question. Great. Yeah, I mean that's where that's where we're trying to get to because the because the seven principles of universal design are excellent. I'm not, and I and I would never, I mean, every single one of these stages are useful and they're helpful and they're helpful for people to rethink things. Um, but ultimately what we're trying to get to is, is, a, is, a, is a brain that says, um, you know, what we're really after is sort of trying to understand what is good for one person will actually benefit another person. And yeah. I think that's a point we implied, but didn't really say about the curb cuts, which was, right. The curb cuts were something that were required by the ADA. Universal design says, oh, they, they, you know, they can be better. And human-centered design says they can be ubiquitous. I mean, maybe that's a, a way of describing it, that you know, we're really thinking they benefit. Something that does something for one group of people will benefit many other people. Um, so we're just trying to rethink it. And a lot of people say to me, when I talk about this, they say, well, isn't that what architects do? And I say, well, you know, don't they think about, isn't human-centered design sort of intrinsic to the profession of architecture? Right. And I say, well, yes and no, because there are so many things that architects are, are trying to think about. Um, and so this is kind of a reorientation. And, and I think um, uh, there's a slide, Lisa, I think it's number six, which is, is kind of my way of describing this. And that is that, for many, many years, um, and this goes back to, if anybody knows uh, Le Corbusier, who was an early 20th century um, architect who was a theorist and whatever, but he, like many architects, were trying to sort of strive for what are, you know, what are we designing to? Who's the average person? How do we standardize things in the design world? And there are reasons to standardize. Um, one of them would be uh, buildings become cheaper if they're standardized and buildings are expensive. The other is 
aren't you glad you don't have to search for a light switch every time you go into a room? They're generally in the same kind of place. So there's a, there's a logic for standardization. Mm -hmm. But what happened was this kind of idea of who is the average person, it, it settled on um, you know, a six foot tall, able-bodied man. Mm -hmm. um, and they are a dwindling number of people, not only, um, but they don't really represent uh, uh, kind of anything that, that resembles a human-centered sort of thinking because, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, that's why we've got the world we've got. I mean, I'm simplifying it, obviously. Um, and one of the important things that drives human-centered design, you remember we talked in the beginning about the ADA defined disability as a characteristic of the person. In, in um, oh shoot, um, I think it was 2001, um, I may be off a little bit, the World Health Organization redefined disability and it said it's not a characteristic of the person, it's a function of a person's interaction with their environment. And, and what that means is that we can redesign the environment. So it, it kind of opens that door to this idea of human centered design by saying, you know, we, we actually can change this. It's like, it's like our politics. We can change this. We can, we can make it better. Um, so, um, we, yes, we happen to have a few examples. Um, so Lisa, maybe you can pull up those, uh, next slides. Um, these are just a couple that, that I, that I like. They're very simple. Um, I, I'm really interested in airports because the other thing about human centered design is that um, people adapt and they get used to places that they use over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. But airports are places that are um, of, of great stress and tension because you're in strange airports, you're trying to you know make your trip and all the rest of it. So I find that airports tend to be places that have kind of thought um, sometimes have thought about what we would call human centered design. And so this example of a men's room and a women's room um, is how do you recognize it from afar and, and see it easily? And also how do you enter it without having to go through a door? So it has both those characteristics, which means when you're with your suitcase or you're using a wheelchair or whatever it is, you can actually get into it much more easily. And I, uh, the picture at the bottom is my comparison. Um, that picture at the bottom is our, you know, toilets that, that meet all the requirements. Um, but I don't know about you, I'd have to get awfully close to tell which ones is the men's and which one's the women's. Absolutely, and yeah. opening the door is not so easy. And the other example on the right is, um, um, as most of you know, the higher and lower sinks um, are part of are the requirements for people who use chairs. And this is, a, and also a, a clear space underneath. And this is a way of doing it in a way that I would, I, it, you know, I could use a little refinement, but it, it begins to get to a sculptural look. Um, it's not separating anybody else out. Everybody gets to choose whether they want the higher sink or the lower sink. Mm -hmm. And it begins to get towards beautiful and usable, which is what I think of when I think of human centered design. And it doesn't it doesn't stigmatize or, or push somebody and say, oh, that one's for you. It's they're everything for everybody and you get to choose which one works the best for you. Yes, bathroom yeah. accommodations. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and then the next slide is a couple of other examples. Again, um, I look a lot at the, at the public environment. Um, and these are two examples and just, you know, uh, uh, or an array of people. The example on the left and the top um, is an integration of stairs and ramps. And as I'm sure a lot of you know, very often the stairs are the prominent means and the ramp is kind of, you know, pushed to the side. Oh, if you need the ramp, you know, you can go over there and use it. Um, this is in a, a, a public, um, it's kind of a, a, a mall um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, you know, I really like it because it, it integrates the stairs and the ramp and in a way that means you can go part of the way on the stair and go the rest of the way on the ramp or you can take the ramp the whole way. And it just, it allows everybody to move kind of together, which is the other I thing. I love that. Separated. Yeah. A lot of the time, like I, I go places like this or go to some kind of event 
and I have to literally go all the way around the corner or all the way up the street and around the corner or, or on a completely different address to find something that, that's accessible to me or yep. people with, yep. with yep. a wheelchair. And it's, it's actually very, um, it's very disappointing because you don't feel a part of, you feel like you're separate, like it, it's being made harder for you to, to do something so simple like enter a building or find a place that's accessible to you in the way that you are built. And sometimes I, it'll turn me off of a place completely if I see how a place is designed and where a ramp can be found and how easily it can be found or if they even have an accessible entrance. And it's so crazy to even say that, but I've turned away from places sure, and I've decided sure. not to go to places if yeah. they don't have an accessible entrance or if I don't find that it's easy to find the accessible entrance. Yeah, yeah. And and some of it, some of it is, is um, that other the other example up there some of it's very easy to do that other example um is was a raised intersection and we don't need to go back to it but it's a it's basically saying why um it it, it eliminates the need for a curb cut because it says everybody can uh, everybody who's walking or or on the sidewalk continues at the same level and we raise the intersection up and then we make the cars go up and over the intersection because in many cases there really doesn't need to be that drop down for the right. cars you, you you what you're trying to do is slow the cars and then and a and a curb cut and an intersection requires all kinds of things but if you make the car slow down by having to go up and down you know and then it means you don't have to go up and down the um, question on the screen says is there a place you see in need of redesign right now if i had to answer that right off the top <laughs> i'm gonna let you answer that <laughs> i would say soho and be, i will say that because mm -hmm. soho nyc so south houston street is it houston i think that's how you houston yeah, yeah houston yeah. street um i don't go there often because it is a horror it's a lot of cobblestone um streets and sidewalks and just the way that the buildings were designed a lot of them don't have an accessible entrance of any kind i will give a personal example and this is something that i'll never forget because i did actually um hurt myself when i went to there's a juice generation on prince street I is it like prince and spring street between those two streets um, and I love to get smoothies from there. So I thought, okay, there's one right there. Super good. Like I'll go in and get me a smoothie. And then I go <laughs> there and I was completely disappointed to see that not only did they not have a handicap accessible entrance, um, they didn't have any kind of railing or anything for me to at least climb up before the four steps that they had to get to the front of the door. So not only is there not an accessible entrance, but there is not even any type of assistance to give to someone like me to climb up the stairs. Mm -hmm. so I was really, really disappointed. And I actually ended up going inside of the Juice Generation and voicing my frustrations <laughs> because anyone who knows me knows that I am very vocal and I'm a self advocate. So if I see that something doesn't work for me, I will be the one to be the voice to say like, hey, this doesn't work. I don't think this is good. So I went to someone and I said, hey, can I speak to the manager or someone I can talk to about getting some kind of railing or something outside? Like if you guys are not gonna have a ramp, mm -hmm. then there needs to be some kind of rail to help someone like me on crutches to get up the stairs. And a guy actually offered to help me when I left out and I was so grateful to him. But when I was going up, I literally like tripped. I caught myself before I fell, but I twisted my arm because I was trying to catch uh, myself. Yeah, and yeah. It was just, it was just horrible, it was horrible. And I've had so many examples of this, but I just wanted to share that one. Yeah, so that's a good thing. one. And you said something in, in what you described that we also had talked about before, which I, I think is worth considering. And that is 
somebody came to help you. And you've talked before about, uh, you know, yeah. we have this, we have this ingrained um, social belief in independent living and independence. And that is certainly what, what the original um, makers of the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, were asking for. And it, it's, it's so important because mm -hmm. you, because you can live on your own, you should be able to live on your own, right? right. If you want to, and that's the independence part about it. Right. Right. That, that, that's what we're fighting for is that, that, that we can have independence when we want it. Absolutely. But we also were so reluctant, all of us to ask for help or to expect help or to be comfortable with help. There's a negative connotation under asking for help. It looks like a sign of weakness. And I absolutely believe that we do need to change this narrative. We do need to, um, it's a social construct. I think that's built against us to know, to believe that people who are offering help are doing it because they feel sorry for us or doing it because they feel like they're obligated to or doing it because they want to feel good about themselves. And those are all, those are all, I believe, a part of a narrative that we need to change. And we talked about this, Barbara. Um, I've, I've more recently become more comfortable with the idea of being more comfortable with asking for help and accepting help because I don't believe that we should we should be able to block a person from being able to do that. Mm -hmm. I, it's a blessing for someone to come and offer help and for people to kind of project their own feelings about it on a person that is genuinely trying to help. I don't agree with that. And that's something that I have trouble with and I am working on. And I believe that just like you said, if we want, if we're trying to live independent, why is it so hard for us to be able to do that? What does that look like to make those mm -hmm. changes? Yeah. yeah. And I think this message of asking for help is so important. Yeah, I'm seeing that. And I'm also thinking, um, I, I, I so agree because I think, um, uh, design isn't going to solve everything. Right. And, and we are recognizing that the range of, 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 a, of uh, the range of design is, can't solve all the problems. Right. We need to, to be able to help each other. And I think about, um, you know, somebody helps you get out of a tight parking space, right? What What's the difference between that and somebody helping you get down the stairs? You yeah. know, we're all trying, we're, you know, we, we're, we're comfortable. I'm comfortable. A driver is comfortable with somebody saying, you know, come like this, you know, go like this. Don't hit that I'll, car. What's I'll the difference? I'll another personal example of something that happened more recently. During this COVID pandemic, I've had trouble getting my own groceries mm -hmm. because the grocery delivery apps are being overused by able-bodied individuals. I'm not calling anybody out. I love you all. <laughs> but for the sake of the conversation, I will say it, it is being overused for for. Things that I see are necessary, like they need to use them. So I'm not saying that they're wrong, but they're being overused. And people like me who have physical disabilities yeah. or people who can't actually go to the supermarket to get things are kind of being left on the back burner to like fend for themselves. So my neighbor from upstairs, like she now has a thing and she says, hey, I'm going to the, to the store and I'm, I, do you need something? Do you need milk? Do you need eggs? Do you need, you know, things like that. And it was very, very hard for me at first to accept her offer. I said mm -hmm. no, but eventually I realized, Shanique, you can't be hungry. Like it, it's hard <laughs> for me to actually go yeah. to the supermarket yeah. and get groceries, yeah. carry yeah. things like water, to carry things like juice, to carry, mm -hmm. you know, heavy things that I like to eat or drink. And I shouldn't have to go without that because I don't want to accept help or ask for help. Right, right. So this is sort of a way for me to help myself to be a better human. And mm -hmm. back to your statement, it, it comes down to us as humans. It doesn't always rely on design. It is, design is a part of the problem, but 
it it is also we as humans as well. And I will be the first to say that I do have some work to do and I'm actively working on mm -hmm. being able to accept help and not seeing it as a weakness. Mm -hmm. Asking for help can lead to yeah. miss that. I'm sorry. Asking for help can yeah. important changes and modifications to make easier. Yeah, no, this is this is a, a topic I I I, I gave a, a lot of thought to, and I think it's, I think it's important. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I was working on housing for homeless families and adults, particularly, and, and, and homeless individuals who um, might live with and without disabilities, actually, who might live in, in shared housing or supportive housing or SRO type mm -hmm. housing. And then how, how do you respect people's independence and offer them a platform for getting to know each other. And if I just give you an example, and I'm not, I haven't thought about how this applies, but in that kind of housing, what we would try to do is think about a multiple multitude of different public spaces that were smaller mm -hmm. and larger um, so that people would feel comfortable, go, you know, having, having, sitting with some, with a, somebody who's a stranger but beginning to be able to talk to them in a room or allowing people to preview something before they walked into a space so they knew what they were getting into. Right. So there are a lot of ways to design places and spaces that, that allow people to interact in a, in a way that is, is independent and comfortable but then begins to allow them to make make connections. It just depends yeah. on, you know, are we talking about grocery stores? Or are we talking about, I mean, in grocery stores, you could actually, you know, how they have a place where you put stuff for delivery. Well, you could have a place where, you know, oh, do you live in this neighborhood? Um, I'm going to leave my groceries and you're going to pick them up for me. I mean, there's a way you could do that. In other words, you could go and pick stuff out of the grocery store, but your neighbor could come by and pick it up if there were a place in the grocery store where they could carry it home for you. You know, we could think about that. We actually have to wrap soon, but I would love to know. Um, we have about three minutes. Uh, <laughs> but before we get into contact information for those out there who want to contact you, I want to ask you, is there something that you would like, uh, an ideal situation or an ideal fix that you would like to see immediately or in the near future <sighs> in terms of... Yeah, well, this is something we've all talked about. Yeah, I'd like to see the New York City subway system become yes, available. Right. I mean, that's really that. I mean, it is. It has been a a kind of shockingly appalling process to see how buses and subways um, and the subway system, of course, in New York City has has been unable to become available. It's just. So it's yes, disastrous, disastrous. So <laughs> yeah. Jasmine just joined us. Hi, Jasmine. She said, "Hi, Barbara and Shanique. Are there any foreseeable accessible design challenges due to the COVID pandemic and the reopening of businesses?" Hmm. You know, it's oh boy, it's hard to say though. I I you know I I think about touchless door opening, for example. Um, there are wonderful examples of um, uh, sensor uh, doors that open, you know, can open doors with sensors, and they're kind of wacky on New York City streets because they right. open and close all the time, um, as does as the D'Agostino on Eighth Avenue and Fifty Seventh Street. But, right. um, but if we can begin to think about that kind of intersection, um, everybody's going to benefit. You know, things that we can do in the environment that would be touchless, for example. I love that. So and also, I, I also have an idea. So the six feet, I don't know how long we're going to have to stay six feet, feet from each other. But that that seems to be a little hard for me. Like when I'm waiting for things at the pharmacy or just waiting in any type of line, what is that going to look like? Is there going to be prioritization to those who have um, any type of disability, those who mm -hmm. can't, who don't know how to stay six feet from people. Right, right, Maybe right. those right. on the spectrum who don't understand the idea mm -hmm. of space. I mean, there's a lot of different things that we can think about in terms of yeah. 
how yeah. COVID yeah. will affect um, yeah. accessible design. And thank you so much, Jesby, for that question. Yeah. It looks like we it, are- We could go on I that one for a while. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish we could do like a part two to this conversation or something. But before we go, Barbara, is there a way that people can contact you so that we can continue this conversation? Absolutely. I, I have an email, um, beconnect at gmail.com. There it is. Yeah. I'm um, happy to be in touch with anybody that wants to talk about it some more because this has been really fun. Thank you. I'm so sorry that we have to like cut this short and we were like right in the in the midst of everything. And we hope to continue this conversation uh, offline, but we do have to disconnect from this. But make sure you guys tune in on Friday <laughs> at 4 p.m. We are having a tap dancer on. And that will be interesting. And How she'll fun. have she'll be working with a child and teaching some tap dancing lessons. So make sure to tune in with us from four to four thirty. Oh gosh, wow. someone just someone just sent a comment. Wait, don't disconnect us. I want to see it. <laughs> now is a tremendous opportunity to redesign cities with systems, systems. that help citizens citizens to move with special attention to those who are interdependent but this involves raising awareness among our leaders and industry designers user and family yes absolutely raising the consciousness is what we keep doing i love that yeah. i love that seriously i love that like yeah. can we just find a place to talk about this continually <laughs> like make it an open conversation yeah. anyway you guys this was awesome. Thank you it very was much. Really, here's it was my heart. really Thank fun. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Take care, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Stay safe.